Well, good morning, Redeemer Bible Church. Uh, this is The Daily Word, and I am Jason Stinson. I am one of your pastors here at the church, and it is my privilege today to take us through Matthew chapter 14, and we're looking at verses 1 through uh, 21 today. And so what we have here is really is a two kind of major historical accounts, two big stories. We have one being the death or the beheading of John the Baptist, and the second is where Jesus feeds the 5,000, or the multitudes really is a better way to uh, to put that. So it's a lot. There's a ton of awesome truth and theological goodness here, but uh, for the sake of today's video, uh, video we're just going to take you, I'm going to take you through these verses here and just kind of take out a couple uh, of the main things that we kind of see going on here. Not everything, but some of the main things. So um, I think starting right off here in chapter 14 in the, in the retelling of the story of, of the beheading of John the Baptist through uh, verses 1 through uh, 12, I think we see kind of two major things here. Uh, one would be uh, the difference of two men. One man that lives his life in fear, fear of man, fear of everything almost. And then another that doesn't fear anything but God. And so he's got this fear of God alone. And so therefore he has no fear in this life. And we see the contrast of those two men. And then also one major thing that we see here in this story is is that uh, man, a Christian's reward, someone who follows Christ, their reward is, is not found on this earth, but it is in heaven. And it's so obvious to us that that is true in the story of the beheading of John the Baptist. And so let's just, uh, I'm just going to read through these, these passage here, and uh, we're going to take a look at what's going on and just kind of talk through some things as we read through this. So starting at verse 1 here, is, is at that time, Herod, the Tetrarch heard about the fame of Jesus. And so this Herod, right off the bat that we're reading here, this is not Herod the Great that we know of in, you know, the Christmas story, but this is uh, one of his sons, actually. And, and the, this region was kind of divided up into about four different parts. And so this is one of the kings over this uh, part of Galilee, really. This is part of Jesus's kind of great Galilean ministry at this time. And really, this, this whole section here, chapter 14, is really cool in the sense that this is kind of the, um, kind of the, the, the top of his big uh, ministry to thousands of people, really. This is kind of coming to the end of that, where he will start to focus on his disciples only. And so, um, here we go. And so we're looking at Herod here. This is uh, not Herod the Great. This is one of his sons. And uh, he hears about Jesus' fame. So now Jesus, as he's been teaching, as he's been going out and, and doing miracles and all these different things that he's been doing, his uh, fame is kind of reaching its height. And large crowds are following him places, as we'll see here, of course, in the feeding of the 5,000. And so um, this, this word of Jesus gets all the way to the top, it gets all the way to uh, the, the head uh, of people, the king, and he hears about Jesus. And then right away we start to see the fear that Herod has. And just listen to what this says here. What his response is to hearing about Jesus and his ministry. And so Herod says to his servants, This is John the Baptist. He has been raised from the dead. And that is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. So now you kind of already see this kind of like troubled conscience that Herod has. That he... He hears about Jesus and his ministry, and, and he immediately is filled with fear and thinks, this is, this is John the Baptist raised from the dead. And, and, you know, when John was on earth, actually, he didn't even have or do really any miracles or anything. So, But here, Herod thinks that now he's come back with these miracles. And so you can kind of see this troubled conscience that Herod has and this fear that comes over him that, that John the Baptist maybe has come back from the dead. And so, you know, him kind of like, wanting to see what's going on here. And picking up here um, in verse 3, it says, For Herod, and here's the account of what had happened. This is why he fears that this could be John the Baptist coming back. So this here is kind of like a um, kind of a retelling of what happened with the story of John the Baptist being beheaded. So just listen to this. It says, For Herod has seized John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. 
because John had been saying to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. So there's we, we see that John had been confronting Herod about this uh, illegitimate relationship, really, that Herod had with uh, his brother's wife. And so this is a tangled web of, of, uh, of relationships going through there. There's incest here and adultery here, and it's, it's really bad. And, and there's a whole, whole many levels of um, kind of impurity here going on. And so John the Baptist, having no fear, even to leadership, even to the king, confronted him on this relationship that should not be. And John said to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. And so, because he confronted Herod with this truth, which I just think is so awesome, I think even for us, as we think about uh, where we're at in life, and we think about government control, even right now, and all the different things happening, and, and us, in, in some form or another, some level, having to stand up to authorities with the truth of the Word of God, and what we know to be true, um, having, you know, no fear of man, but fearing God and wanting to serve God ultimately is truly should be our goal as well. And I think that John the Baptist here model, uh, models that clearly for us in the word. And so look at this, because John um, confronted the king, he, he says that because John had been saying to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. And though, and so... Herod wanted him put to death. But again, read, it says here, he feared the people. So again, we see this fear in Herod that even though someone would confront him about his sin and he wanted to kill John the Baptist, he wouldn't do it because he feared the people. And, 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 and it goes on here uh, to explain that out a little, a little bit more. He feared the people because they held him to be a prophet. And it goes on to say, but when Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias, and Herodias, by the way, is just an evil woman in the Bible. And I don't have time really to get into all of that, but just a horrible person, really. But uh, the daughter of Herodias danced before the company and pleased Herod so that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. So... Prompted by her mother, she said, Give me the head of John the Baptist here on a platter. And the king was sorry because, because of his oaths and his guests, he commanded it to be given. So the king actually uh, was quite fond of John the Baptist, really. And, and even though he hated the fact that John the Baptist, you know, would confront him in his sin. But he feared the people and he kept him uh, in, you know, kept him bound up here and so now his this this evil woman Herodias wants to have his head on a platter that's what she asked for and so in fear again Herod knowing that he needs to keep his oath with this in fear of even though he's the king and could probably just do whatever he wanted but in fear of what would happen to him if he didn't do this goes and orders this to be done and so here we if you look at this and we read on it goes, prompted by her mother, she said, give me the head of John the Baptist here on a platter. And the king was sorry because of his oaths and his guests he commanded to be given. He sent and had John beheaded in the prison and his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl and she brought it to her mother. And his disciples came and took the body and buried it and they went and told Jesus. So that is a, is a horrific story here, just kind of tossed into the middle of Jesus and his great Galilean ministry. And um, again, we see the fear of man uh, with Herod, and we see the no fear of John the Baptist here as he would uh, stand up for truth, even if it meant, and it did ultimately mean, and losing his life for it. And so that's just a, it's a sad thing. And it also goes on, like I mentioned before, it has this other main point in the fact that like, you know, John the Baptist was, Jesus has said that there's, there's, there's no greater man that has lived on this earth than John the Baptist. And he was the, of course, the one that paved the way for Jesus's ministry. And here we see that his life sadly ends after standing up for the truth, after saying what is right, that he gets beheaded in 
in a, in a silly party because uh, somebody asked for it. <laughs> and so he gets beheaded. And so what we learn here is you can read that and be like, man, that just doesn't seem right, right? It doesn't seem right like a man of God that's doing God's work, that this is, would be his fate. And we understand that um, when we hear a story like that and we see that, that we understand that our rewards as Christians are not uh, in this world. They just aren't. They are in heaven. And we see that so clearly in that story. And then next, we've got this massive, uh, probably the biggest, one of the biggest miracles, of course, other than the raising from the dead, that we have here in Jesus's ministry. And all, all of the gospel accounts have this story in it, so I think it's very significant. But we have in here the, the feeding of the 5,000. And I think we see a couple major points here in this in this. Uh, account also and there's there's so many things like i said but a couple major things that i want us to focus on today is uh two things is the compassion of christ that'd be one and the second would be that christ uses us to do great things to do his work and so with that comes a, a great responsibility so let's just kind of read through this and um and see what what how all of that comes out so it says here now when jesus heard this so when he heard of the telling of the story of john the baptist being beheaded he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself so jesus i think at this point is starting to understand that um that it's not his time yet in fact where we're at right now in about one year from now exactly is about when he would be uh, crucified. Uh, so it's it's at that point in his ministry, but he realizes that it's not time yet. And so hearing of the beheading of John the Baptist for standing of the truth, hearing the fact that his teaching had gotten to Herod, of course, by this point, he knows that, that it, he's starting to withdraw from the large crowds. And so um, he hears this and Jesus is tired and he needs some time on his own. And he would much, very much like to just pull away but we see here that the crowds are ahead of him, and they go out, and uh, and they and they find him. So it says here, but when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. And when he went to shore, he he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. So even though he needed time, even though he was tired, even though. Uh, it was he, he could have every right to just be like you know what I'm I'm done right now it's, I I don't have any more time for ministry I need to pull back and be alone contemplate my friend's death all of these things he sees the people show up knowing full well that most of these people are just there for the show really but even in that when he sees this great crowd and even in his time of needing rest he has it says it right that he had compassion on them. And he immediately starts healing their sick. He immediately starts um, doing kindness to these people. And so look, starting at verse 15 here, it says, Now when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the village and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. And I think there's something major in that here in the sense that, like, uh, the disciples, you know, they see things so much differently than Christ does, right? And even though they're probably all tired and it's all been a long day, and they're just looking at their resources and they're saying, like, hey, we've got this large number of people that, were, that you're serving that would need to be served, and we do not have the resources to do that. Send them away, right? But Christ, he sees things as God sees things, right? His... his his knowledge is, is far above our ways, ours. His ways are not our ways. And he says, they need not leave. You give them something to eat. So immediately, you know, God doesn't say, Jesus doesn't say, you know, hey, okay, they don't need to leave. I'm going to feed them. He says, you give them something to eat. He immediately lets, the, lets his disciples in on what's going on, right? And I think a lot of us, I think that maybe we see a, a great need, maybe even, even in our own churches, we see 
a lot of people here, a lot of people coming to the church, and we could be very easily think, man, we're tired, we're overwhelmed, we have too much to do, you know, <laughs> send them away or whatever. I just need to be alone for a while. But no, you know, it, we understand that it's not our power, that the Lord uses us to minister to people. He uses, he tells us to give people something to eat, to you do this work. But he empowers us. He actually is the one doing the miracle. He just uses us to um, to do great things for people. And I think we see that here. So then he says to them, uh, they say to him that we only have five loaves here and two fish. And he said, well, bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and set and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up 12 baskets full uh, of the broken pieces left over. And those who ate were about 5,000 men besides the women and children. So thousands and thousands of people. And I think it's amazing that there were 12 baskets left, you know, just what the disciples needed, right? And so Jesus here uh, performs this amazing miracle. And again, I think that... Um, when, the main thing that we can see in this, and we think about this large crowd, we think about the need that they have, and they think about how they only had this, this small amount of resource to be able to take care of all these people. I think that tells us a major thing here. And what I would, that I would what I, all of us to get out of this story here today for the Daily Word would be that all true Christian ministry is beyond our resources, Right? All true Christian ministry is beyond our resources. We do not have the resources to minister to, to everyone, to, to the people, even in our own families, in our lives, in our workplaces, in our, in our homes. We don't have the resources, but Christ does. And so we need to rely on Christ, that it isn't about us, that, that yes, God uses us in spite of us and how amazing that truth is, but it is not about us. And actually, the worst service that we can do for Christ is to think that we can do it all ourselves. But we need to rely on Christ for all things. And so that is our daily word for today as we looked at uh, the death of the of, um, John the Baptist and, and Jesus feeds the 5,000. And that's just a short little piece to get out of this uh, today. And I hope that you enjoyed it. And we'll, we'll be back tomorrow for, uh, for the next one. Thank you.